Okay, so I'd like to start by thanking you um, for this opportunity of being here today. The Slap of Initiative is uh, the reason why I still keep on doing this job, and a special thanks for Liz uh, for, for asking me to talk about this topic. So I'm going to tell, it's going to be a bit of a repetition, but that's good because it means that we are in the same line of thought here. And I'm going to tell you a bit about pay for performance, the pros and the cons, okay? Um, Okay, so just uh, a definition of uh, pay for performance. I was quite surprised to see that the majority of the definitions that you find in the literature or in policy documents, uh, to be frankly honest, tend to focus a lot on quality. But for me as an economist, pay for performance is a bit broader than that. So it's a, a range of uh, financial mechanisms that can be implemented in health systems to improve performance generally uh, uh, defined. And uh, if you want in economics, and I'm not going to bother you too much with this because Luigi is part of my job, um, um, this really was uh, studied initially in the contract theory, principal agent theory, uh, literature in economics, and the idea uh, of, uh, behind this type of uh, uh, performance payments is that you have a principal, uh, there is, uh, it could be a purchaser of healthcare services, an agent, there is a provider, for example, of healthcare services. The, the agent is in charge of doing some task uh, uh, for the principal, and the principal would like uh, uh, that agent to exert some level of effort. However, effort is not observable, and uh, uh, the agent uh, can be a bit naughty and uh, make things that go against uh, the main aim of the principal. So effort is not observable, but output, generally defined, also is observable. So the, the principal can make a, a payment, can build a, a, a payment mechanism conditional on observed output in order to induce the optimal amount of effort. Now, economics, the economics literature has extensively studied uh, this uh, issue. Of course, the main advantage is that, you know, to, up to a certain extent, you are able to induce effort with uh, such type of mechanisms. Uh, you can also uh, uh, improve morale because you link somehow, even though indirectly, the payment uh, uh, of, of the providers, of individuals, to uh, the effort that they exert. But there's a series of, uh, of issues uh, surrounding and warranted effects, if you want, surrounding it, uh, this type of payments. And the first one, uh, Luigi already talked uh, to you, the, the issue of multitasking and observed and observed quality. Um, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. Uh, you have a problem of uh, uh, risk selection, so that it might give an incentive for providers to uh, pick up the easiest case so that they, they show up as performing better. If uh, the, the poor performance of certain providers is outside of their control, it can be unfair towards some providers, so it can create an unlevel uh, play field. Um, it can also, if the uh, rewards are um, individual, so they target specific individuals, it's also not good uh, for collaboration uh, that is so important uh, uh, in the context of healthcare provision. It can also uh, crowd out intrinsic motivation. So basically, it, it strongly assumes that individuals react to money, or money is quite important. And uh, in healthcare in particular, there might be other uh, motivations behind uh, effort. And there's, there's some evidence uh, in the literature that uh, shows that uh, if you introduce financial incentives, then you might cut out that that's, uh, uh, intrinsic motivation that individuals have. And also, these schemes can be quite complex. They, might require, they do require lots uh, of data, and therefore, they might not be cost-effective. So the benefits that you might observe, they might be outweighed by the cost of implementation and, man, man, um, and maintenance of these type of policies. So what I propose to do after this uh, very summarized uh, um, revision of economics is to tell you about some of the experiences. And I was quite lucky because, as Luigi mentioned, the European Observatory for Health Systems is about to publish uh, a book on uh, uh, the experiences on pay for performance. So this is uh, uh, to, to a great deal thanks to them that I have these slides here today. Um, and I'm going to focus on service delivery uh, pay for performance. So I'm not, I'm not going to focus on other things that could be understood as pay for performance, like pay for performance for patients, so incentives to induce healthy behavior, or value-based pricing, for example, in the context of pharma. We'll discuss that tomorrow. So, the, so far, we have, um, they have identified uh, 15 uh, experiences in primary care and 16 in specialist and secondary care, hospital care. Now, if you analyze um, these policies, Oh, sorry, I forgot to pass the slide. If you analyze uh, these, um, these interventions um, uh, in terms of the domains, uh, uh, they tend to focus 
almost always on quality. So that, that tends to be one of the major goals, to improve the quality of provision of services. And maybe that's one of the reasons why the definition of uh, pay for performance in many policy documents is a financial incentive, incentive to, uh, to increase quality. Uh, now, quality is a very uh, broad term, and there are three types of quality that these interventions tend to target. Process quality, for example, the adherence to best practice guidelines, so the processes of delivering healthcare, structural quality, IT, equipment, human resources, uh, and outcomes. Outcomes tends to be uh, not present in all, uh, all policy uh, experiences, and when they are, they tend not to focus on mortality and morbidity, because it's extremely hard to link uh, uh, first to measure uh, quality uh, of care, but also to link it with performance. So when they focus on outcomes, they tend to focus on uh, intermediate clinical output. There are other dimensions of these schemes, and I have to say that the majority of these uh, policies, they tend to uh, uh, combine different domains of performance. So many of them also, coverage, uh, uh, also cover uh, pri uh, pri uh, coverage for priority services, like uh, prevention, immunization, uh, screening of chronic conditions, and some very few focus on efficiency. For example, the French case on the incentives to uh, prescribe generics, so uh, cost-effective prescription, and some, in some other, ex other experiences, patient experience of satisfaction, like the quality of outcomes framework in the UK, and uh, uh, equity, or the reduction of health inequalities, like uh, in New Zealand. <coughs> So what the observatory has done was to try to make sense of all these policies and somehow to compare them in a very crude way, because this is not really proper fancy econometric, is because data comparability is quite an issue. And also the way that these policies have been implemented doesn't really allow that. What they conclude is that pay for performance did not lead to breakthrough performance, uh, um, performance uh, improvements. Yeah, I thought I had 12 minutes, so I should slow down. I actually have 20. <laughs> So paper performance did not lead to breakthrough uh, performance improvements in any of uh, the programs. So if we go and see uh, uh, the specific uh, targets of domains, if you want, uh, the story is exactly that. So if you look at quality, uh, there's been some uh, impact overall, but tends to be uh, uh, well positive, uh, but also quite modest. Um, this has mostly been uh, in the disease management of chronic conditions, uh, some increase on the coverage of uh, preventative services, in particular immunization, uh, immunization and uh, screening for some cancers like breast cancer. Uh, for those uh, uh, policies that target process of hospital care, again, it has been a very limited uh, impact. Perhaps one of the, the be best examples of uh, success story is the German disease management program for which that has focused quite substantially on diabetes where we have observed that the quality uh, of care um, uh, for uh, patients with diabetes has actually uh, increased and actually that has been reflected in health outcomes with decrease in uh, uh, mortality but also a decrease in hospital admissions for those uh, type of patients but for the other experiences also when you look at health care outcomes you actually don't see uh, too much uh, of an effect. Patient experience, the same story. Even though this is not targeted by the majority of, uh, directed by the majority of the interventions, for those that do, there's not substantial improvements in patient experience. Equity, again, the same issue, even for those policies that uh, uh, explicitly uh, have as an aim of uh, improving access or reduction in the gaps uh, of access in between the different subgroups of the population or different regions. Again, they have not, you cannot really observe tremendous results. For efficiency, the same story. There's not been substantial, uh, uh, there have been some positive experiences like the, the pay for performance scheme in Brazil uh, that has, uh, for which the, the hospitals that experience the policy in comparison to those that are not targeted by, by the policy, not only improve the quality of care, but also at, uh, at a decreased cost in comparison to their peers. And what seems to uh, come up from all these exercises from the European Observatory is that, however, the policy hasn't, this policy hasn't been that much effective, but there are some good and important uh, spillover effects, that is data generation and usage, uh, in particular, also the usage of that data in the relationship between purchasers and providers, uh, enhancing their communication. Okay, so somehow hinting that perhaps in the future we, there going, there's going to be a payoff from all this investment. <coughs> now, what to do that next is to try to look at 
at these interventions and, and try to identify key success elements uh, uh, of, uh, of this policy. So for those that had a positive and though a modest uh, impact, they tried to uh, tease out some of the, the key possible elements for success. Um, in terms of scope of these policies, uh, the, the, those that tend uh, um, to, to have multiple targets rather than very si uh, single and narrow targets tend to work better. And those that focus on uh, groups of individuals rather than individuals, uh, specific individuals, also tend to work better. And those that are integrated within a broader performance uh, 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 initiative that does not only focus on financial incentives also tend to work better. Okay? And this, what I want to argue for this slide and the next slide, is that these are not novel things. These are things that we know from economics, from economic theory. Okay? In terms of design of these schemes, uh, size, Luigi spoke about the size, uh, uh, what is the size of the incentive, and that's so important for economists, and size does matter in this context. Um, uh, the, the, many of the policies that haven't had an effect, the size of the reward was too small. Also, the frequency of the reward matters, uh, and uh, we don't necessarily need very high-powered incentives, so rewards that are too large, but it's important that the, 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 the time, the lag that goes be, uh, between the, the time that the individual, the provider, exerts effort and the reward is not too long. So it should be frequent. Uh, and again, this is insight that we already have from the economic literature in, in economics, behavioral economics, or behavioral sciences, as you want to call it. Again, it should also be broad uh, um, uh, rather than narrow performance indicators, so they are able to capture in a better way the quality, the quality of care provisions. Those that incorporate risk adjustment mechanisms are also important so that they reduce the undesired effects of this type of intervention. And again, this is something that we know from health economics. Um, the involvement of the agents in this design, uh, in the design of this policy is extremely important. And this is something that we know from the psychology literature that if you involve individuals in the design of this type of schemes, then you build a sense of ownership. And if you build a sense of ownership, that they're going to adhere to the policy much, uh, in a much more effective manner. In terms of implementation, um, this is quite an interesting uh, finding is that those pay for performance schemes that are tied in with provider payment systems, with the main reimbursement systems of the providers, tend to work better. The theory here tells us something a bit different, especially behavioral economics literature tells us that they should be separate, so that the reward is a bit more salient. Otherwise, it might be uh, blurred within uh, the main payment system. However, what they, they found in, this, in, this analysis, in their analysis is that the, the pay-for-performance schemes that either reinforce the, 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 the main incentives uh, established by the main reimbursement scheme or that are used to mitigate uh, the, the, the unwarranted uh, condition, the unwarranted effects of the main uh, uh, payment, provider payment scheme do tend to work better. So a sense of, uh, in a sense, an alignment of uh, priorities, if you want. And then, of course, also the alignment with the vision and strategy uh, of uh, not only policymakers, uh, clinicians, everybody that is involved in this process, taking a, a health systems perspective. It's, it's extremely uh, important. And again, this goes back to the involvement also on the design and uh, 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 the importance of that to build that sense of ownership of the policy. And again, also these insights are insights that we have from uh, the academic literature, not only from economics, but from psychology, from sociology, from a broad range of social sciences. When you look at um, when you look at uh, the elements, and I think I've hidden here one slide, but there are also elements that weaken uh, incentives. Uh, one of the elements that they found is the complexity of uh, these interventions. Many of them have many indicators, and uh, providers just get a bit lost. And again, this is an insight that we have from behavioral sciences, uh, from also behavioral economics, is that individuals are not really able to process complex decisions when they are li linked with financial uh, incentives. Also, the selective participation in program domains. Many of these experiences allow providers to self-select either in or out of the program, but also when they're in the program, what, what domains that they want to participate in. And again, we know that there, there, this leads to a self-selection problem in the sense that only the best performers are going to apply, those that are performing quite badly, so for them, it's not really good news, so they'll decide to stay out. 
Um, and finally, they also found that incentives that, that are targeted at improving uh, the organization of service delivery and the infrastructure tend not really to work and might even be a, a negative in terms of impact of effectiveness. And again, this is not very surprising because there's, lots, there's really not much evidence that links infrastructure, for example, with exception of uh, information technology, with improvement in the processes of care uh, or even healthcare outcomes. So, my, I think, my, I guess my main message from, from um, this last part is to tell you that just observing the policy experiences without making any, uh, uh, without wanting to make any causality uh, um, uh, arguments here, it seems that lots of the propositions that are put forward for why these policies do not work seem to be quite close to what we predict uh, or what we, the models that we develop in economics, but also the theories that we develop in psychology and sociology. So uh, to, to summarize, what um, the evidence to date is that impact is limited, okay, but only, not only in terms of effectiveness, what they uh, propose to do, so uh, the improvement in performance in all those dimensions. There's also not that much strong evidence of the unwarranted effects of the gaming. There are some, of course, uh, but they are not as strong as we would expect. Um, and that makes, makes me really question whether um, do these policies work? Is pay for performance any good uh, for policy? Should it be rolled out? And um, does, what, what does it mean, these... Uh, uh, no impact or lack of effectiveness. It might be that actually performance is no good in the real world. It might be that we need more evaluation. Uh, it might uh, just be that they might work, but we need better design, okay? And in all these three possibilities, my message is that economics can help, economists can help, sociologists can help, psychologists can help. So the, all this multidisciplinarity uh, that links academia and uh, uh, policy makers, but also clinicians, is extremely uh, important. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you.